Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the Football Grump, and with me as always is Mike, the Cranky Fan. Merry Christmas, Cranky Fan. Merry Christmas, Grump. We, um, a day late, three three flights later, we, I am in sunny Florida, 44 degrees, so don't, uh, don't get too mad at me down here, but uh, yeah. After a, uh, a, a a tough Giants loss, but one that's not as debilitating to me, to my soul, as the Washington tie, for example, or the, the Philadelphia blowout. I came out of this game feeling we can beat, we can play with these guys and we can beat teams like this. So lots to talk about. I am not down in the dumps after that, although I'm getting sick and tired of these teams getting 61 yarders at the end of games to beat us. It's very annoying. It is annoying. This is exactly what I said was going to happen. And I guess the fact that it just keeps happening makes it easier for me to predict. But, you know, I thought my, my prediction here was that this would either be a boat race or more likely a close game that they lost in heartbreaking faction, fashion. I was off by one point each. I thought this would be 26-23. It was 27-24. And um, the second half of my prediction was that this tight game that they played would uh light a fire inside of them it would it would you know the opposite of the way that the locker room felt after the washington tie like you were saying is what i think they're feeling right now they feel like they are a playoff team and i even said like a couple weeks ago right like they're just not playing like a playoff team and it, it goes beyond numbers it goes beyond you know the health of players they just looked like shit for a couple weeks there. They had a really serious dip. This loss doesn't make them look like they are not. They, they looked like a playoff team playing this game. They looked like they could win, that they were going to win if this went to overtime. I felt very strongly that um, I, I felt hopeful going into overtime. What I didn't feel good about was them kicking that field goal. Yeah, I mean, um, this is a team that has, you know, I'll try to do this analogy. This may be horrible, but it may be appropriate. We're an average punting team. We have an average punter. And after Washington, it felt like we just shanked one off the side of our foot. In a game like this, I feel like we outkicked our coverage because, you know, we have limitations. We, you know, obviously you could see our our wide receiver court is very limited. We are missing, and I can't under stress this enough enough. We have no Adoree Jackson. We have no Xavier McKinney. It changes our secondary completely. We're trying to defend probably if there's an MVP of receivers in the league this year, the MVP of receivers. And when you don't have your you know, CB1 back there to try to, to defend him, it, it changes everything back there. And they did as good a job as could be expected with this roster, this coaching staff, with everything. So, you know, May not be the same parallel, but remember after the playing the Patriots that year, they were undefeated. We lost that game, but we walked out of there feeling like, you know, after turning off the TV, like we we may be able to compete with these guys. And and there was that after effect of confidence. And I think that's what we can come out of this game. I mean, we can argue all we want about is Minnesota really a two seed? Are there, you know, they have a paper record, you know, they, they, are very, very fortunate in one score games. Um, but that, that all regardless, we went into a hostile environment, a whiteout, and played our asses off and gave everything we 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 could. So I feel a lot better after a game like this and after the tie, for example, in Washington. To me, you know, they that losing malaise they were in, I think after this and after the Washington win, I think is in the rearview mirror at this point. Well, yeah, I think part of it is they didn't – during that stretch of not looking like a playoff team, they just looked conservative. They looked scared. They looked in the box. They looked very pedestrian. They looked like they would try to get a lead and then just hold on to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, like that was – it kind of looked like that was their strategy was to jump out ahead quick and then just protect, protect, protect. This was a game where they just – they were attacking. Mm-hmm. And uh, man, were they attacking? Do you want to st- let, should we just start with the offense? Go right into it. Yeah, I mean, this is gonna jump right off the page. I I think it would behoove us to just talk Daniel Jones right off the bat. Um, Daniel Jones went thirty of forty-two 
for 334 yards, a touchdown, a pick, uh, and four carries for 34 yards. Daniel Jones was lightning in this game, man. Uh, I gave him a star, and I, it it didn't even take much of a uh, much time to think about it because rewatching the game, like there's a whole bunch of stuff that it was really just Jones doing, uh, just. For instance, you look at the first touchdown, the the, the touchdown pass to uh, Isaiah Hodgins. That play wasn't open. That play was a mess. You had pressure coming from the front side and the back side. He felt the back side pressure. He saw the front side pressure, so he stepped up in the pocket. Then he slid to the right to drag the underneath coverage to follow him and to keep Isaiah Hodgins keep moving across away from Patrick Peterson. He pretty much just threw him open. Isaiah Hodgins didn't have an, it, it couldn't have had an easier job scoring a touchdown. Daniel Jones did all the work, and it was just all kinds of subtle things like that. I mean, he was he was also ripping lasers into tight windows, um, like crazy. Daniel Jones, I I, I saw this um, sentiment being shown around Twitter, whatever, from big beat writers down to your normal Giants fan. That Daniel Jones played like he earned a contract in this game. And uh, I would have to – I mean, I don't think that literally. I don't think they saw this game and they're like, yep, contract. But I think yeah. that this is the nail in the coffin like, yes. Whether the contract is here or somewhere else, Daniel Jones earned himself a second contract. He earned, yeah, he's earned himself that he's a starter in this league. And again, if you want to compare, you know, watch the game tonight, the uh... – the Indy San Diego game, and then see these hacks like Super Bowl winner uh, Nick Foles. Nick Foles. I mean, you know, watch some of these quarterbacks are in the league and tell me, you know, do you think this team would be better with Daniel Jones? Hell, Grump and I were texting on Christmas Eve saying, how much better would Dallas be with Daniel Jones over Dak? You know, Dak is a one of those. You know, hot take arguments that Grump and I have been arguing about for years. That what is, you know, how good is he really? And we both came to the conclusion that Dallas is closer to Philly when Philly has Jalen Hurts. Let's not get crazy about, you know, what beating a backup like on, on on Saturday. But we both came to the conclusion that they're probably closer to them with Daniel Jones and Dak Prescott for the things he does. I I gave him a star also. But what I did do is I did give a fart to Giants Twitter, you know, especially the media, because I saw more than one people after the pick say and there's bad Daniel Jones. There was nothing wrong with that throw. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I want to give a little insight to people. You know, just come close to your speakers and listen. Sometimes quarterbacks throw interceptions. It happens. Watch a, watch a Buffalo game. Just because you throw a pick, that doesn't mean there's, you know, bad Josh Allen or bad Tom Brady, although there has been a lot of bad Tom Brady this year. I mean— Everybody is so ready to jump on the Daniel Jones, the I told you so, you know, going back to your narrative from four or five years ago. There has been no bad Daniel Jones this year. There's, I made a mistake, Daniel Jones. That happens. There's bad throws here and there, but newsflash, that happens. Look, there's there's a ton. You're wearing a lightning sweater right now. I'm wearing a devil's shirt. Most of our fans are probably Rangers fans where Henrik Lundqvist was king for years. Allegedly. I mean, fantastic goalie, one way mm-hmm. or another. Right. People still score goals on really good goalies, just yeah. like great quarterbacks will still have a bad throw, or a bad game for that matter. So taking one little thing, like you can, even if you're the biggest Daniel Jones hater on the planet, you can just take this game as a good game. You don't have to find something to find fault. He was he was fantastic in this game. And, you know, the interception. Well, there's, fine, there's fine fault and there's push your narrative. Same, that's but Yeah, it's pushing a narrative. There's bad Daniel Jones. There, if you have a narrative still of bad Daniel Jones, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you know, I'm not going to. The, the media is just as culpable. Adam Amin, I mean, I, I have. the media. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I have, I have no love affair for the Fox D team of uh, Adam and. Uh, Mark Schlereth, but the same narrative came up where he pulled up the stat. That's that's Daniel Jones' fifty-third fumble in or forty-second fumble in fifty-three games. 
We know that that is incredibly lopsided to the first two years of his career. We know this. These facts are indisputable. They've been stated. They've been restated. If you've watched the Giants the last two years, you would not come away thinking that Daniel Jones is a fumble machine. If you've only watched the last two years. Hell, if you've watched the last three years, I think you would say, man, it's been a while since Daniel Jones really had a bad turnover game. It, the forced fumble thing, it's not really a thought to me anymore. He does not really... And for the record, they recovered the fumble. Evan Neal had a bad block, and suddenly it's a Daniel Jones stat and conversation. Right. Yeah, I mean, really, that's that's your story. Seventh overall pick had a rough game. I'll say that. Evan Neal had a not good game. Evan Neal and Mark Lewinsky. I didn't give either one of them farts. This kind of just fell into the dishonorable mention category for me. But... See? The right side of the line, they just they did enough for Daniel Jones to make the most of it, but there's no reason Daniel Jones should be getting sacked three times and hit seven times. And it's mostly overall, on that front side. You feel overall Evan Neal from week one to you know week sixteen, there's overall improvement. Yes. Um I but agree. The, the 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 thing that was gonna take the longest for him to adjust to was going to be past sets against speed rushers i mean i could have told you that and it's not gonna be a one-year thing especially when there's an extra game now in the nfl you know playing playing 17 games i mean how many games do they play in college uh you would play 12 in an sec game 13 and two playoff games like up to 15 up to 15 right um but with a huge gap in between those playoff games and the end of the season right right so This is going to happen to rookies anyway. Uh, But, I mean, I'm still going to call it like I see it. He didn't play a good game. Mm -hmm. So. It's something that, you know, it it spotlights more now in the season when expectations are higher because of the record. I mean, if they were going to be this 5-11 and team in the middle of a rebuild, you wouldn't care as much and you wouldn't notice it as much. But, you know, now that we're fighting for a playoff spot and we're playing a high-profile game on, on Christmas Eve, it's going to show up more with Evan Neal, but I and I wouldn't be, you know, I would not be in any sort of camp or narrative that that was a bad pick or he's going to be a bust. I mean, it's just, it takes time for rookies in this league, you know, tackles and guards to get their feet wet. And, and, and especially if they have one stronger suit than the other. So it's okay. Um. Generally, I didn't really have any other offensive line notes. I thought that Nick Gates and Ben Bredesen pay, played pretty well. I thought John Feliciano had a fairly good game. Andrew Thomas played his usual good game. Mm-hmm. This was a good collective effort from the offensive line. They're not good, and a lot of the places that they need to upgrade, center, right guard, that's not going to change, but they didn't play a horrible game set this game they played yeah. well enough where daniel jones could step back in the pocket and rip him um, and well enough also that saquon barkley can do some things that he oh yeah let's do you want to talk barkley how did you think he did yeah i um i sent you a texture and we and again you may or may not know this if you, if you like we don't really we, we go to the games together home games obviously but on the road you know he lives in jersey i live in the city We try to very rarely communicate during a game because we want our takes on the show to be fresh to each other and unique to ourselves. But the one of the few notes I did, you know, text over to to Grump during the game was he looks kind of rejuvenated in this game, like you know, more fresh than he's had in the previous five or six games. You know, we're seeing this thing, this little spin move he has now. He looks like he's cutting and making hitting holes a little more than he was. Um, there definitely seems to be like a, a little bit of a second life for Saquon. Hopefully that can last, you know, the next two plus games. But I've definitely noticed something that I hadn't seen, you know, in the month of December at least. Well, I'm wondering if it's the – and I, I'm not really the, the smartest guy in the world. But I think I, – part of it I think is he's feeling a little bit better. I think he did sustain some kind of thing maybe in London or around that time, early October, and it's not really gotten better, and it's finally the last couple weeks feeling better. I think also the offensive strategy seems to have shifted to throw first, let Barkley wear them down when they're already exhausted. I think 
I think the idea seems to be if we can get Barkley the ball in space when the defense is winded, there's a better chance for a Saquon play than going Barkley first down. And and I th- I think that's been the strategy for the last couple of weeks, and it hasn't worked. I think they've tried to throw first, run second a lot. We've we've been seeing. Uh, in opening up games the last couple weeks that Daniel Jones is slinging it towards Richie James, Daniel Bellinger, Isaiah Hodgins early in the game, but they're not converting first down. We're seeing a lot of incomplete passes. We were seeing some curl routes on Darius Slayton, I want to say, not this game against the Vikings, but the week before against the Commanders that were getting swatted down on early downs early in the game. This game coming out throwing worked, and it worked really well. I mean, they stalled on some of their drives early on. They had some mistakes here or there. But even the times where they're trying to get the ball in Barkley's hands early on first down, they've been trying to – and again, this is an observation. I don't have numbers in front of me, but it felt like more and more towards the end of the game, whatever. But that first play, they're throwing to Barkley in the flat a lot. That's their way of starting drives and getting like a second and five, second and six, second and four kind of situation is having Barkley run out to the flat, throwing to him. I guess they have clear out stuff to leave some space there. Yeah, he gets tackled, but it's it's essentially like a five-yard run. That's all it really is. You're just throwing it out to the flat. And then you get yourself into second and five, like I was saying, and then they'll run Barkley off the left side or something like that. And he squeezes through, and you either get the first down or you're in third and very, very short, very manageable. Much better for this team. Mm -hmm. Um, On the day, I thought Barkley looked fantastic. Like you said, I do think he is rejuvenated. I think he's feeling himself a little bit there. But 14 carries, 84 yards, that's pretty damn good. Um, In addition to... Uh, eight catches on 10 targets for 49 yards. And that touchdown was on a fourth and two that he just saw and hit the hole. And then he kind of like angled himself in a way where the safety coming flying down from the too high safety spot just completely at a terrible angle. And he just, (laughs) he just absolutely abused him and took it to the house. It was like nothing for him. I I thought Barkley had a fantastic, I think this was one of the best Barkley games we've seen since the beginning of the year. I think when you're watching this team for the rest of the way, don't worry about numbers necessarily. Because if you look like on a stat sheet, 14 for 85, it's all right. But that's like a good running back game. Trust that's... what your eyes are showing you, I think, with this team. It's even the same with Daniel Jones right now. You know, we had this discussion, I think it was the was it the Washington game, maybe? When it was like, you know, those numbers look that impressive. I'm like, well, if that one, you know, the one pass downfield isn't dropped and all of a sudden it becomes this. So it's like Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley for this season, I think the eye test will tell you more how effective they are being than their actual numbers will. And that's OK, because right now we're at that point in the season where, you know, we are fighting. You know, we're probably going to make the playoffs. Let's see what we can do. We'll worry about long-term things later and rankings and all that stuff later. But right now it's just effectiveness. You know, getting through next week, getting through the week after, getting to the playoffs, that type of thing. And right now their eye tests are certainly showing more than what their numbers are. That's okay. And, and Yeah. And, and to further that, one other Barkley note I had uh, in, in speaking about those throws out to the flat on early downs or whatever – I've been pretty critical of Saquon Barkley as a pass catcher, strictly catching the ball. Uh, he had one play that they they knew that was coming. We went to the well kind of often towards mm-hmm. the end of the game, and they were in his face. He kind of bobbled the catch, and yep. in that bobble, he managed to kind of make the yak situation. But I don't even know how to really describe it, but he bobbled kind of forced him to go further outside and like – he corralled it and then took it up the sideline for a huge gain. It was a fantastic catch, really, really good concentration. Wanted to throw the kudos at him since I've been so hard on him catching the ball the mm-hmm. last six or so weeks. Um, we've been uh, What I said about um, Daniel Jones playing incredible, elevating the talent around him, I saw this sentiment around. Isaiah Hodgins had a fantastic game. Um, eight catches on 11 targets for 90 yards. A touchdown for most of the day he was squared up against Patrick Peterson. That's pretty fantastic. The catches he was making were pretty nuts too. I mean, like the outstretched one, you know, that's that's all the complaints we had about Kenny Galladay not really kind of diving for anything or 
mm-hmm. uh, extending his arms. We saw that from him. He had some savvy moves at the top of his route, forced a DPI at one point. Um, I see a lot of people on Twitter saying that Isaiah Hodgins should be back next year. He's certainly earned a contract, whatever. And I, I'm not going to say that he didn't play well, but we are talking about a guy that has earned, we think, the wide receiver four contract. That's really what we're talking about here. Really right. think about what Daniel Jones is doing, and Mike Kafka and Brian Dable, for that matter. They're scheming things um, to attack defenses, etc. But mm-hmm. we, 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 this is what we're talking about. We, we are talking about a wide receiver four that well, was yeah. just abusing Patrick Peterson throughout this game. Yeah. I mean, would you want Isaiah Hodgkins as your wide receiver two? Go uh, on any other team that's in the playoffs right now? No. No. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it, it, he's doing a – he's the type of depth piece that if you have him as your wide receiver four, you're pretty excited about, you know. But let's put – like to your point, let's put in perspective what he really is. And we're asking right now him to do so much. So, I, you know, we – in our little pre-talk before we started, I was going to say that the wide receivers, you know, as a collectively, I was going to give a fart because of all the drops. and. You know, then I kind of thought about my own, what I was saying to myself is like, we're asking so much from these guys who just do not have the overall skill set to be relied on to catch everything, to be open on every route. So I kind of rescinded my fart for, you know, the wide receivers as a collective for for the drops. I mean, the drops are just going to happen because this is who we have. This is who we're dealing with. So... But it was annoying at the time. I, I will say that. I was well, frustrated. Yeah. I, I, and I'll, I'll say, like, I agree with you. Um, it's clear that the offensive line, like I said, played collectively pretty well. Um, the offensive line played well enough to win this game. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reasons that they lost this game, we can go into them. But, like, wide receiver drops are definitely part of it. Wide receivers just being ho-hum in general was a problem. I mean, they really schemed every possible advantage they could. And and Richie James is somebody that I didn't give a far to, but falls into that dishonorable mention category. Another one with about eight catches, about 90 yards. Um, but he had that really awful drop on third and five. That was a drive, absolute killer. He was wide open. It was a clear drop. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. A straight up drop. Um, and, and he was, when I say wide open, I mean like the third and five, I mean, the first down is that's done. He was going to get some serious yak on that play. Mm -hmm. That was a scoring drive that died. Um, I would also say that on the big throw downfield, he was wide open. I'm not really sure he got both feet in bounds. (laughs) I I mean, we didn't get a lot of replays, which was interesting for Fox because they tend to give you three angles of every single play. Um, the conspiracy theorists are out and about, you know, after the uh, the end of the Washington game. So, <laughs> no, nah, well, I mean, it's close. I'll say that much. The one replay we have, it's just difficult to tell if he has control when the one foot is on the ground or mm-hmm. not because the angle, it's like an over the shoulder kind of catch. So you can't tell. But my point is, is that if he didn't get his feet in bounds, that was on him, not on Jones. That was right. a great throw. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is this is what Jones is dealing with. This is kind of how he's hanging with the number two seed in the NFC. Are you starting to get frustrated with Daniel Bellinger? Daniel Bellinger was another one I have right under here as my not a fart, but dishonorable mention. He was two for two, mostly a non-factor. I this is a game where I would have thought he would, needed to be a bigger factor. He had the big catch early in the game, lots of yak, and he fumbled punched mm-hmm. right out of his arm. I mean, and that happens from time to time. But other than that, the only other noteworthy play he has is the two-point conversion, which, that again, All how much of that was him and how much was Jones. Yeah, yeah. I have, I so, have yeah, I would say I'm getting a little... But but as a, as a blocker in the running game, he is still giving something that was clearly missing when he was out. But, I, yes, I am getting frustrated. Okay, and again, we are him a pass. I mean, you know, still, he's a rookie. He missed some time. He's it. You know, that's 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 what we have to work with with, with tight end for right now. But, you know, it just <laughs> again, 
we are ahead of our skis where we thought we'd be at this point in the season, and now we're expecting a little more where what should our you know, real level of expectation should be right now. So it's okay. Um, other notes on offense. Do I have anything else? Did I go through the, the Daniel Jones touchdown? On you this did. Rec- you okay. did. Uh, you went over the two-point conversion, which I thought was his most impressive play. I mean, that's, I, that's it, a, I, I just – that's a you think he's not making two years ago. That was also improvised. I mean, yeah. they sniffed that shit out. That that play was dead all over, and mm-hmm. Daniel Jones made that happen. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I thought I thought the touchdown was a little bit more impressive. I felt like he did literally all the work on that play. Um, the, I don't. I I just I don't know how much of the two point conversion was a little bit luck. This is Patrick Peterson. I mean that. It happens. It's okay. Slightly out of his reach there. But offensively, I think the only other thing, this is just kind of like a general coaching note, but I think it's most evident on the offensive side of the ball. The team felt organized this week. Mm-hmm. Um, like you know, like I was saying on the Richie James play, and this is more Daniel Jones than anything, they were already lined up and getting ready to go, and he heard the crowd react to the instant replay kind of I, I guess cheering Kevin O'Connell to throw the challenge flag. Daniel Jones just started clapping. They snapped the ball. They moved. Yeah, I um, that. that was great. Another thing, the Saquon Barkley touchdown. That was a fourth and two. I mean, right there, they're calling a play to get two yards. There's still plenty of time. It was before the mm-hmm. two-minute warning. They need to score and get a two-point conversion just to tie. And right. they were at like the 30-yard line. Now, forget the two points. He just takes it – or the, the – the two yards he just takes it to the house there is zero celebration they turn around they are getting ready to line up for that two-point conversion now i'm being very dramatic about this these are kind of small little things but these are the small little things that winning teams do and yeah. to reiterate my point the the six weeks that i was saying that they look bad they didn't look like a playoff team it was little shit like this that losing teams can do you can be prepared and not be good enough and lose. They were not prepared. They didn't look organized those couple of weeks. They just looked organized this week. Hell, even last week they had to call a timeout on defense. They couldn't get subbed right on a right. couple of plays. They had guys running in and out when the ball was getting snapped. Right. Just generally, situationally, they felt much more in the game, prepared, ready to play. Um, and that speaks to coaching, I think. Oh, 1,000%. And I – it. it you made the point three, two, three weeks ago about, you know, have they lost confidence? And you say, oh, confidence is so much a part of this. And now that the confidence seems to be back, you are more susceptible to coaching and you are more listening. And that's why, you know, that was my biggest thing for this year was, you know, if this team could somehow make the, you know, be in a playoff run, you're speeding up the rebuild and the building of the culture. Because if, you know, we were three and nine again, how much are you really listening to your coaches? How much are you getting up on a Wednesday morning in early December when it's cold and raining out and giving 130% to prepare? You know, but no, when you are playing Minnesota and you are trying to keep your playoff, you know, uh, spot and everything. It's a tough going, environment too. Yeah, you are going to dot your I's and cross your T's more. And the more that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, the faster this culture that you know joe shane uh brian dable mike kafka wink martindale etc etc are trying to install so this has really been above and beyond expectations for a season and turning this thing around for the long term let's flip it over to the defense flip i you know just generally speaking do we think well i guess i'll ask you do you think and is the general consensus i'm curious and i don't really know that the defense lost us this game do you feel that way does does the universe feel that way because i don't feel that way i don't i think that this game i think the consensus of everybody in this you know who watched this game was this was a really close game and you know, it looked like it might be going to overtime, and they hit a, you know, a long field goal to win the game. I don't think there was anything that we lost it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like giving up the play. screen right before the 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 field goal, I guess, is kind of tough. But I don't know. Yeah, but you know, those are those things where it's like, how much time is left, and it's you know, 
Right, preventing exactly. Preventing the big play, and you're preventing the touchdown, so it's they not essentially a- force them into a 61 yard kick. Exactly. It's nine times out of ten, considered a win. And again, I said at the beginning of the show, when you don't have a Dory Jackson and you don't have uh, Xavier McKinney back there, it is not the same against elite. And also, Aziz Ozalari, he got hurt in the game. He was out. Uh, you know. You don't have all of your pieces. You're kind of string, and you don't have the depth that other teams do. I'm not making excuses, but they're facts. So I can't blame the defense on this at all. I just think it was just a game that was close and we lost. Okay, I, I agree with you. Um, and you mentioned a couple things. The first, Adoree Jackson. I, forget even just Adoree Jackson in coverage as opposed to Darnay Holmes or Nick McLeod on Justin Jefferson. Or, or even Fabian Moreau, for that matter. Forget that. A lot of the throw, or a decent portion of the big-time throws that Kirk Cousins threw, and I'm not taking anything away from him for standing in the pocket, taking a lick, and throwing in Justin Jefferson's direction and completing a pass. There's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make him a lucky quarterback. What I am saying is if from the moment of kickoff, Justin Jefferson was being covered by Adoree Jackson that whole time. Kirk Cousins is not randomly throwing in the direction of Justin Jefferson without looking because pressure is in his face. That throw just isn't going to happen because that coverage will have been tighter all game. He's not throwing just randomly at Adoree Jackson. So it's not even about Adoree Jackson's like skills at the point of the ball and as opposed to Nick McLeod or anything like that. I just think the throw doesn't happen just by virtue of Jackson and coverage. So also- not having Adoree in this game is huge against arguably the best wide receiver right now. It, it was the worst. If, they, if you can point to one reason why this team – didn't maximize what it could have this year. And that's the reason. And that is the biggest blunder of this coaching staff in this entire season. It's not whether they went for it on fourth down on play in game X or, you know, the trading got Tony or sitting Galladay. I mean, I think this trumps that, all like, of that shit. This was a bad game plan against team. Why it was that singular decision to have him back for punts, which, you know, We'll see specific, if there's any specific you know reason of a, but like a game like this, just to your exact same points that that could have been the tipping you know, easily uh, of, of this game. You know, and again, if if there was one thing I could switch about this game, any one thing, and that includes play, even it includes the field goal kick. If I could switch anything, I would just put a Dory Jackson in this game. I I don't even think that this game is that close. I think in the last two minutes. We feel comfortable that we're going to win. That's that's how good they played in this game without would, their star oh, defender. Down to that final drive, I think in two minutes, possibly. No way. So, yeah. Yeah. That that is the one thing. If I can change for anything from the season, that would have been it. Yeah. And you mentioned Aziz Ojalari. I gave him a star. He only played half this game. I I just this is insane to me. He has played this year. September twenty sixth, he didn't play a full game. October second, he didn't play a full game. He's essentially played December 4th, 11th, 18th, and then half games for 926, 10 2, and 12 24. In that stretch of time, which is probably about five games total, he has five and a half sacks, three <laughs> forced fumbles, one fumble recovery, 14 tackles, and a pass defended. He will only be. 23 years old at the start of 2023 his birthday is in june and that will be his third year of experience in the nfl yo aziz ojalari is insanely good that i think that that second round pick has might be a huge steal from the draft yeah Uh, and, and and i thought that where he was picked was fair i thought that he was not a first round pick but the results, I mean, the numbers are right there. He is, and they they come at opportune times too. Right, right. Um, he didn't get the strip sack today against, or whatever, two days ago against Kirk Cousins, but he almost did, and then he got the sack anyway. Um, are, you starting I, I, to concern, are you starting to get concerned about all the injuries though, and just not for him? Up? No, I mean it's been two years. It's two years. Yeah. He's a he's a young guy. Um, we often see in junior senior year. Um, college players get the big injury that mm-hmm. makes us worry around draft time. That is not at all uncommon. 
And when we scout players, we often have to just kind of guess and say, you know, whatever. It is what it is. I mean, I don't think he has a serious injury problem. I think he came into this year injured and he tried to go right away, re-aggravated it, and it is what it is. There are annoyances. But, I mean, if at a second-round pick you get, let's just say, 12 games a year. Obviously, he got less than 12 games this year. But if you only get 12 games from him a year, is that really a huge problem for you? No, as long as if that's the lure of the lack of availability. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, I think in general, they're always going to have that third, not premier edge rusher, but very solid edge rusher. Right now they're making do with Jihad Ward. But I think mm-hmm. they're always going to have that third guy in the rotation to give Kayvon and him spells. That, I mean, uh, yeah. that, obviously, right? But I mean, not just a scrub depth guy like Taman Fox right. or whatever. Right. Like they'll have a, they'll have a real guy like a veteran like Jihad Ward. They're always going to have that guy to kind of help anyway. So if he misses five games, he misses five games, four games, whatever. Um, it feels weird that we haven't given him a star every single game this year. But Dexter Lawrence, man. <laughs> Six tackles, one tackle for loss, a pass breakup, a quarterback hit. I have come to the conclusion while re-watching this game today, he is a constant mosquito in the backfield, right? <laughs> you know when you're like when you're doing bullshit out there, you don't you don't have a yard and do yard work or anything like that. But you know when you you're you're in Florida and you're fucking you're at the tailgate, right? And there's yep. just this gnat or something. It's just always buzzing around your head because you got an open bottle in your oh, hand. Yeah. And oh, you yeah. just it does it. Does, you can walk twenty feet away. You can go talk to the other person. You can throw the drink out. It's in your ear now. It just lives <laughs> around your head. That's what Dexter Lawrence has been to quarterbacks all year. It doesn't matter what they scheme in front of him. It doesn't matter if they do quick passes, run the ball to try and slow him. Down. There's nothing that any team has done to truly slow him down this year. He has been that constant mosquito. And even when Leonard, Leonard Williams goes down, it doesn't really seem to impact him. No, no. I mean, it clearly impacts the team, but not him. Right. Um, I, I, I honestly think that we could give Dexter Lawrence a star for every single game this year. That's not usually my style, but I, I was just watching this game and I was like, God damn, there's just nothing they can do to stop him. Even if he's not making the play, you see him shedding the center and getting in the backfield. It's right. just nonstop. Um. And to that credit, I thought Landon Collins had one of his best games in the last couple of years. And it wasn't all that crazy, but sack, tackle for loss. He had a huge pass breakup on third down. That was surprising, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I I think that to his credit, he has humbled himself a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, he spent a lot of time on a roster without being active this year. I mean, they signed him in October, very early October, before London. And he didn't really see significant field time until this week and the week before. Yeah. Um, And I think getting adjusted in the system, playing more of a linebacker role than a safety role, took time for him. But it it might just be where he's at in his career, physically. You know, then let's go ahead and give a star to um, Joe Shane then. Because we came into this season knowing we had next to no money, on uh, you know, in the salary cap to make really any moves at all, you know, in case you know somebody got hurt or we need to upgrade somehow, and he's made these little moves of getting guys on this roster that were not here, you know, either during training camp or on the initial fifty-three that are on this roster and making significant uh, contributions. Yeah, I would not have thought that signing Landon Collins would have done something huge for this team. I mean, he was, I think he was just sitting on his couch. I think so too. Yeah, he was cut uh, by Washington, and I think he was just sitting there. Yeah. Um, defensively, I thought I thought they played pretty well, considering you know Minnesota's kind of set up in a way where they have a competent quarterback who can make all the throws, and just a plethora of skill position players Mm -hmm. and they just kind of i mean it just seems to me that they just ride that and score points and then just hang around Mm -hmm. and that's that's really their skill set and to be honest 
yeah. to be honest, that doesn't really work well against the. I mean, it, it that doesn't work well for the Giants defending against that. Typically, mm-hmm. I mean, I was kind of worried about how they were going to line up in the defensive backfield, but they just threw pressure at Kirk Cousins, and it it seemed to slow everything down a lot. And I, I didn't expect the offense to come out firing like crazy, but. I if I have said it once, I've said it a million times. The best defense is a good offense. You put up points, and even the worst defense will look better. Sure. Well, now we've seen Minnesota, you know, up close. You know, I think I asked you this question a week or two ago. I'll ask it again. You know, who would you most rather? Who would you least like to face in this first round? You know, based on final seedings and everything you know tampa bay obviously but you know we can make throw them in the mix because they have this you know this pixie dust in two minutes of games they hang around for some reason and they find ways to win but san francisco with brock purdy this team this minnesota team or tampa bay those are my choices yeah who would i least like to see yeah niners they're the most complete team tampa bay is at a point where even Brady isn't elevating them to wins. Minnesota, I, I mean, I want them again really badly. I would love to play this team with a Dory Jackson. Um, I shit, think- I'd, I'd love to play them fully healthy. But I, I'll say this. We're not sure Tampa Bay is going to win. We might have to deal with Carolina or something like that. But the team, other than the Niners, I don't want to face is Detroit. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to play the Lions again. Yeah, I feel like that could be a potential boat racing, possibly. And uh, and I don't really know why, um, but they're just playing. I mean, they got they got their asses handed to them this week, but generally speaking, they're playing well in the second half of the year. Well, here. the good thing is we wouldn't have to face them unless there's some crazy conference final where you know two wild cards are facing each other. So yeah, no, it, that would be a second round uh, deal potentially yeah. if if yeah. they even sneak in that's why I, that's why i was talking specifically about those three because those you know those are the most likely we're, we're most yeah. likely going to play san francisco unless you know well, well i mean in, minnesota, unless minnesota falls that's that's possible too i mean it was a crazy weekend i mean think about all the teams that lost to have green bay to get a, a potential a potential shot to get in you know the washington the giants seattle detroit yeah, all and it all teams. happened. Yeah. Yeah. None of those teams, I mean, they're all fighting for playoffs, but none of them are great. And the odds is, you know, there's a good chance that all of them could lose again next week. Although, if you watch the Indianapolis game today, we'll preview this at the end of the week. I'm, I'm feeling a little better about myself going to next uh, su- Sunday's game. I am. Wait a minute. Yes. Okay. San Francisco is only one game behind Minnesota. I was just checking the standings. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So, yeah, they, they absolutely – there is a chance that we play Minnesota first round mm-hmm. if we lock up the sixth seed and San Francisco passes Minnesota. Um, Sounds like a potential road trip, bro. You ever been? Minneapolis? No. Yeah. It's my favorite NFL stadium. And, I, and uh, it looks cool as hell. It's- I love the – first of all, wait, wait, wait. We're going to talk about this. Yeah, the please. whiteout thing was super cool. I like that they did the whiteout end zones. What the hell did Fox do to its broadcast? Whether like the colors were all super saturated. I hate Fox. Like I, I even don't. like the Giants blue looked like this crazy electric blue. Do you know? Do you know what I'm talking about, or am yes, I just going crazy? Yeah. Okay. I don't understand. For an extra point or a field goal, you can't have a normal friggin camera shot then if it's a 61 yard to end a game all i need to know is i need to see if the ball goes through the goddamn uprights or not easily they have these crazy they always have these crazy angles they use that stupid sky cam thing and it's just i just boxes bugs me always has they try to be too cute i can't the believe game. they're still rocking that robot thing Ugh. Since, like, what has it been? Like, 1994, they've had that <laughs> dumb robot spiking the ball. And, like, it's like... Yeah. I, I don't even know what to say about that. Is that, like, a mascot? Like, what is that? It's stupid. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, Minnesota is, is, is a 
is a fun town. I know it'd be like minus a thousand in January, but yeah, but it's uh, a dome. Who gives a shit? We wear t-shirts. Yeah, yeah, it's great. I mean, well, you gotta once you go outside, you're gonna kill yourself. But uh, so what? It's, it's it's an underrated city. Good music scene, good food scene. The stadium. I can see that. I mean, the food, beer. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it's the uh, the dome is just east of downtown. You jump on a a light rail, and it's like two stops from from dead downtown. It's great. <laughs> The only downside I would say is like there's just a, a serious potential that there's a snowstorm that kills your flight. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna we're gonna talk about one more thing here from this game, and this may be if you're gonna pick a thing on field that lost them the game. I think it's time that Joe Shane, Brian Dable, they walk away from Thomas McGahey. The special teams, the blocked punt you can say was a direct reason that they lost this game. Now, I am not going to blame a blocked punt, a bad block by the long snapper on the special teams coordinator. It's not the coach's fault that that happened. What is the coach's fault is that in the last however many years now, special teams has never been a difference maker on the positive side for us. Never. The, they have only been... Uh, as the, the the big plays have only been as big as the kicker's leg and the punter's leg. Yeah, was, the individual crazy. efforts. Now, if if you're not going to be the difference maker to win games, all you have to do is play mistake free special teams. You, and th- this is like, now what the tw- the second time we've had a special teams play with the fumble on the punt, the punt return from Richie James, two in one game, and then and and this blocked drop punt, punt, the drop yeah, punt last week. Yeah, there was a... Or two weeks ago. I want to say there was a block punt earlier in the year as well. Yeah. And, and then if, if Thomas McGahee had any hand in suggesting that Adoree Jackson return punts, that alone is fireable. If you don't, like you said, you don't have great special teams that are difference makers, then you need to be like the officials and not be noticed. It's like, okay, you know, we're going to fair catch it on the 23. You know, we got the punt off and fine. Like, you just don't even think about it. It just sort of happens. Right. And the the, the consensus like noticing and like we're noticing a bad call by the officials. It, the consensus is that special teams doesn't matter. And I I don't disagree with that. It really on a play by play basis is not a huge impact on the game overall. And that's fine, but it has to be mistake free. It can't be the reason you lose. You know what I mean? Like if you don't want to invest the resources, like I said, in getting weeks back, if you don't want to invest the resources in having a killer return guy like Dallas did to get Kevonte Turpin, if you don't want to do that, that's fine. But what you need to be is solid enough where you're not. That's not the reason you lose. And for years, we have been not good or just fine. At what point is a special teams coordinator's job to elevate the talent that he has on the roster to schemes? I mean, what does he do? What does he do all day if he's not scheming up some shit to do something in a game? Nothing. We get all kinds of bullshit where we do cute pooch kicks that get returned 40 yards. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, they've been bad all year. They were bad under Joe Judge, even though that's his big specialty. They've been bad. It's time, man. It's just time. I don't care how how respected he is. How much do you blame that on the talent, like the overall roster talent that, you know, the bottom of of the barrel is – I will. I, the reason that they are not a good special teams is probably due to the talent. That's fine. Like I said, that's I understand that. I can accept that. They're a rebuilding team. Special teams, by default, is going to have worse talent on it. That's fine. But the reason they've been bad, I would say, is coaching. It has to be. I mean, it's it's not like they're playing against these. Like when they play Dallas, I know that uh, John Fossil is a good special teams coordinator. And I wouldn't be shocked if they had some, and plus they have a really good return guy, but I wouldn't be shocked shocked if they had some crazy fake punt or, or just something that they scouted and worked on in practice because he is a good special teams coordinator. But most special team coordinators are just whatever. We can't even be that. Yeah. To, to me, good special teams, again, is mistake-free. Like, 
having the freak returner and stuff, that's just complete gravy. I don't think that even makes you great special teams to me. Exactly, great, yes. Great special teams to me is you never have a punt block. Special teams, to, great special teams to me, you hardly ever have holding. Mental mistakes. Or you know, penalties and things. That to me is... Substitution what, errors, false that starts. That to me is what makes good special teams versus bad. It's not the 90-yard return. It's not you blocking punts. It's you not putting yourself in a hole. Yeah, it's it's getting getting a punt from within your own five and kicking out of your end zone, getting that play off without it being a disaster, to me, that's good special teams. Yeah. I don't ever want to hear half the distance to the goal first down ever when I am trying to return a a catch a punt or or something. That is inexcusable. That's where bad coaching and bad special teams is far more to me of a problem than we don't have a guy who can break loose and, and go 90 yards. Egg exactly. I am not clamoring for special teams to be a big portion of the game, that third of the game that you win that phase and that's how you win the game. I don't give a fuck about that. It's not that important. And I would not waste resources as a rebuilding team on that. But You know what phase of the game is important? It's Offense. <laughs> no, it's field position. Oh, yeah. I mean... You know, and, and every time you have a block in the back, you have holding, you have a legal substitution, a legal formation, you know, all these things running into the kicker, that changes field position. And this team, you know, we're all we've been excited about for them, and we think they're out kicking their coverage, no, t- no pun intended. This is still a roster that is limited and depth that is limited and is rebuilding. And we can't afford to be kicking ourselves and shooting ourselves in the foot for basic things like that so that has to improve to help this team as it gets better with talent wise you know we can worry about like you said making special teams an an offensive weapon right now we need to prevent it from being a defensive liability right so i mean just like my final thought here i can illustrate what i'm saying like this um defensively it felt like this team did a lot of stuff right to stop justin jefferson except finish plays there were a couple of dropped interceptions um there was an interception called back for not an incorrect but a close defensive pass interference call um but you know there was just a lot of just not finishing on the offensive side of the ball daniel jones threw for like 350 fucking yards all special team, like, I mean, like, and, and the offense was not perfect. There was an interception in this game. You know, there was a, a fumble. Um, you know, there were there were problems on offense as well. But special teams just had to play mistake-free, and this was a one game. Mm-hmm. And that was it. They couldn't even do that. You know, like, like I'm saying here that this bad offense performed incredibly well. This defense that's missing its number one corner stopped you know, for the most part throughout most of this game, the number one wide receiver in the NFL. The special teams couldn't even play mistake-free. Forget about getting a big difference-making play. They couldn't even just play good enough to get the win. It's it's beyond frustrating, especially when you have a really big-legged punter and a really big-legged kicker. Well, I think, you know, once we get to this offseason and you have, and I I said this exact same thing talking about, like, I can, my reference again is to Florida football. It's new coaching staff first year. The first year is all about evaluation and it's evaluation of your roster. It's evaluation about your coaching staff. It's evaluation about your organization. It's evaluation of everything. I think you're going to see anywhere from tweaks to changes in this off season with this football team. And I definitely think that special teams is going to be one. And I, I, I firmly believe that you, the time has come. We, like you said, we've gone through a couple of coaching staffs already. We have seen subpar special teams and on the basic tenets of special teams, and those are some of the, the changes that are on the margins that can be done immediately to make this team better. I would agree. But what's good is what we're talking about right now is off-season talk, which normally we would be doing in about three My weeks. In October. <laughs> yeah. Um, next week. New Year's Day, Giants are hosting the Indianapolis Colts at 1 o'clock. And a win, and they are in. They control their own destiny completely based on the events of last week. 
So it does not matter what happens around the league. So if you are going to that game, you or if you're considering it, you should go because this is your chance to see. Since 2016, a chance to see the Giants clinch a playoff berth. And it won't be, and they almost did it last week, which has been fantastic. I was so ready to tweet the blessings of Brian Dayball in his first year as head coach clinching a playoff spot before the end of the year, before Christmas. Yeah. Clinching a playoff. That, that would have been – would you have guessed that shit at the beginning of the year, clinching a playoff spot before Christmas? I didn't have the, the words clinching a playoff spot, period, anywhere near my preseason predictions. Well, yeah, it was not anywhere on no. my bingo card. <laughs> um, so that's coming up this week. At the end of this week, we will have our preview episode for that game, which could be big, could be historic, could be a lot of fun. Um, and that episode will, of course, be on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, etc. But most importantly, on YouTube, where you can see our beautiful faces. Um, and uh, I don't have any other closing thoughts. Anything else? Uh, no. I am going to relax this week down in sub-freezing Florida. It's supposed to get warmer this week. And, uh, you know, I, I really – my goal is – we need to win this week because I don't want that last week to matter at all. I don't want that because who knows? Philly might not care at all. They might care a lot. We, we, you don't want things that are out of your control controlling you. And th- we're playing a really bad Indianapolis team right now. I, was, I watched the first half before we started recording tonight. And, you know, I don't care if it's Nick Foles or uh, Matt Ryan or Jesus Christ back there. That team is bad. And we just need to, if we believe we're a playoff team, Take care of business. Do it early. Don't let them hang around. And let's go to Candlewick Diner with some champagne. That's my goal. Love champagne. Love champagne. Big fan. All right, everyone. We will see you all bright and early Friday morning with our preview episode. Until then, go Giants.